How's it going, guys? My name is Zach with the Movie Castle, and today I'm really excited because we're going to be taking a look at Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Uh, this is a classic anthology horror book uh, adapted by Alvin Schwartz with drawings by Stephen Gamel. Quite, quite famous drawings, as we can see the uh, creepy clown on the cover. These things were crazy. Um, as I mentioned a few times before on this channel, I never really got to read too much kids' horror when I was a kid. And as I grew up, it kind of became this uh, missing spot in my horror knowledge. It was something I was quite curious about and became kind of an enigma. All these things that people grew up with, and I definitely was aware of people passing this thing around when I was younger and everybody talking about being absolutely terrified by all the scary pictures that were in this book. And I went to my used bookstore and I happened to see this sitting on the shelf, a really nice, you know, cosmetically worn a little bit uh, paperback for only two bucks. I thought I'd pick it up and see what I'd been missing. And overall, this is a really good book, but it is a little bit different than what I thought it would be. I mean, right off the bat, uh, rather than just simply saying, written by Alvin Schwartz, it says, collected from folklore and retold by Alvin Schwartz. So yeah, this is a collection of folklore, old-timey horror stories, stuff that would be perfect for a campfire tale. And actually, in the back, there is this whole section of sources. It, it talks, there's like a note section, there's a section that talks about where and how he adapted the stories, and there's a whole bunch of sources in the back. So if you're done with the stories and you want to learn a good bit about folklore, it is actually really knowledgeable there. But in turn, a lot of the stories are quick, and old folklore can get kind of random sometimes. Uh, for example, that famous story in here, the uh, me, what is it? Let me get it right. Me Tai Doti Walker. Boy, I, I had heard a bit about this story. And reading it, it is kind of random, you know? There's a guy in a haunted house and he hears this spirit approaching, singing that song. And then for whatever reason, the corresponding line is delivered by his dog who can suddenly talk now? Yeah, old-timey folklore gets a little random, and some of the stories end a little abruptly, and a lot of them have very little explanation. That being said, usually creepy concepts, but it is very, very strange. And also, reading a bit of old-timey folklore, I kind of feel it is interesting uh, being comparable to like modern day creepy pastas. I, I tell you, passing this book around back in my day where the internet was just starting to become a thing, this book really was our creepy pastas before that was a thing as well. But yeah, there's also a lot more in here than I thought there would be. I thought, okay, this is an anthology horror book, it's pretty short. I thought there'd be about six stories, but no, there's actually 30, I believe, different things collected in this book, and there's also a really wide variety. They're not all just stories. I mean, most of them are, but there's things like poems and songs in here. Every now and then you'll get a few bars of music to tell you how the song's supposed to be sung. And there's even a, a game in here. Um, so I did find there's a lot more things and a lot more variety than I thought there would be. So it is fun every now and then a, a creepy song is just one of the stories. A lot of them are only a couple pages long. I mean, I think like say five or so pages might be the longest story in here. So it's a really rapid fire of a bunch of different crazy story concepts and a bunch of different kinds of stories going really, really fast and just exposing you to a, a ton of different stuff. And also, what I, one thing I found that I really should have got just from the title, 
scary stories to tell in the dark, it's actually pretty clear really early on that the idea is that you would read this book to your friends. In fact, the uh, first section of the book is about jump scares. It has special instructions when reading this to your friends as to when to turn and scream and deliver a scary line. So that was another interesting thing that you want to read this book aloud. That's more the, the point of it. And I'll get more into the creepy drawings in a bit. I am going to turn the camera to the close-up and give you guys uh, a look at the physical release and take a look at some of those. But I do also want to say, um, yeah, reading this book as an adult, it's not as scary as I can imagine what all those kids felt back in the day because boy did I hear stories about nightmares from reading this thing but that being said I picked it up and I read it the first night after I had gotten it and I made the the strange decision to read this at like two in the morning and I, I will say e even as an adult reading this at two in the morning and your cats flipping out in the background doing whatever he does it did get me a little bit on edge, so I can only imagine the feeling that this would be like reading it as a kid. That that would be cool. Man, kids horror used to be so cool back in the day. Uh, but anyway, I really do want to show you guys a little more of the physical release. Uh, we gotta show a little bit of that art, right? So without further ado, I'm gonna switch to the close-up camera. We'll take a little bit of a look at the stories in the art. And yeah, go a little deeper into this release. So without further ado, let's switch to the close-up camera. Alright, here we are inside the castle taking a closer look at scary stories to tell in the dark. Bring it forward and we see the accurate collected from folklore and retold by Alvin Schwartz drawings by Stephen Gamel. And we get a nice preview of what his drawings look like with this absolutely creepy cover with the clown skeleton smoking a pipe. I don't think that's from any particular story, but it is a great uh, image and a little bit of color, which we don't get in the pages, but always nice to see that. And yeah, kind of a simple cover outside of that. But boy, this uh, this black, red and white was so iconic and you could definitely see a bunch of copies of this thing floating around. There's the spine, and I do like it has a little bit of cosmetic wear, but really isn't too bad of a copy. Obviously, brand new would be good, but it has enough of a history, my copy, without being absolutely tattered. The little Scholastic logo. Flip it to the back, see a little bit of the wear here, a little bit of a crease here, and here, and then some of the spine. But we get phantom footsteps, ghoulish whales, creatures that go bump in the night, for a price of only $3.99. That's really fair. Uh, flip it open. Apparently at one point in time it was owned by a guy named Dean. And the store sold it for me, uh, to me for only two bucks. That's pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, we get the also buy this author section. And we get this really fun cover page with a nice haunted house and the chair and stuff. We see... After that, the table of contents, and these are divided into five sections, and we get to see how much is in there. I think there's like 30 stories divided among the five sections, and we get a nice little way to find each of these stories, and then the notes, sources, and bibliography in the back, and of course, to Dana in a little wheelchair whose shadow turns into a bird on a branch. The art's pretty crazy. Anyway, let's take a look at these sections a little bit. I do want to say, oh, the introduction with this picture of a creepy bird with like the devil riding on his back, gee. Uh, but anyway, I do want to say each section has kind of their own gimmick and this uh, sort of host character uh, you see the first section is ah, and he'll be screaming. So I do like how that's coordinated and a little bit of why this chapter is this chapter. This chapter is filled with jump scares. You can use uh, to make your friends jump with fright. So we get like 
the first story in the section, the big toe. And this is, uh, again, this is classic folklore. And we get to see this kid, his family is starving, and there's a shallow grave with a big toe sticking up. So he decides to take it home and his family eats it, which if you don't really realize how bad starving can get, seems very strange. Uh, but of course, they're haunted by the ghost looking for his toe. A classic story, but what I say about interactivity at this point, pause, then jump at the person next to you and shout, you've got it. And it also gives an alternate ending here, which is pretty fun. Um, but yeah, a lot of stories with jump scares, with good creepy art. And you're like this one where the body parts are falling from the chimney. That's pretty iconic. And there's like the classic me tai doti walker and the song lyrics are in bold font here, you know, so that would be pretty fun to perform orally. Uh, we also get this section. He heard footsteps coming up from the cellar, and this one is about ghosts. And there's some pretty good stories in here. The Thing, where some guy sees a, a skeleton monster walking down the street. That's pretty cool. And there's another one. The haunted house, where a priest tries to exercise a haunted house and gets to learn the backstory of this absolutely creepy ghost. I think this is probably my favorite illustration in the book. That is just, yeah, man, kids used to get way cooler entertainment back in the day. Uh, they eat your eyes, they eat your nose. This is kind of a miscellaneous section, but some fun stuff in here as well. And we also get to see say the hearse song where we flip it to the next page picture of the hearse but also how to uh sing it to music you know so like i said there's a few songs in here which i think is super fun uh the girl who stood on a grave a classic story with a twist there at the end as to what's really happening and ah gee um but yeah there's that picture I love how sometimes the simplest things he goes crazy with, and it's like that's the most disturbing picture of a horse I've ever seen. I do want to say, yeah, in this section, we get another different thing. Uh, dead man's brains with this guy with his head chopped off and his brains are in there. And this is actually a horror game. So we get the uh, the rhyme that opens it up. You get your friends in a circle, you turn out all the lights so they can't see anything, and they say, Once in town there lived a man named Brown. It was years ago on this night that he was murdered out of spite. Here we have his remains, and the idea is it's dark, and you pass around these different things, but you lie and you tell your friends, here's his brains, pass his brains around, and it's like squished up tomatoes. And yeah, maybe if the kids are young, it might be hard to get them to actually coordinate this. But I think if you actually played this game proper, it'd be really fun. The idea is how many of your friends can make it to the end and how many get scared and don't want to touch what is innocuous, but they're told is parts of a decaying corpse. That's really fun. But that being said, my absolute favorite section of this book, Other Dangers which is about modern horror. And oh man, in this section, the hook. You open up with some classic stuff in here. You know, the classic boy and girl, they hear about the escaped criminal with the hook on his hand. I mean, that's a classic story that everyone knows. And, and here it's collected in this book. And we also get things like high beams, which I think was featured in the movie Urban Legend where a girl is driving home and she's harassed by a truck and it keeps flashing the high beams at her and it has this great twist at the end. And then the babysitter, and again, the baby and the babysitter are super creepy even though they're not the horror of the story. Uh, but this is the classic babysitter getting threatening phone calls and a twist that is absolutely iconic that we've seen adapted into a few movies actually. And the last section of this book is Ah Again, uh, and it says the, this has the same title as the first, 
but the ones in here are designed to make you uh, say ah in laughter instead of horror. And to be honest, some of these don't necessarily hold up. Uh, it's kind of like they end on this weird joke and you're like, oh, Okay, that's what it's building to. Some of them are kind of funny, and I do love the art stays absolutely horrifying, even though these are supposed to be funny stories. Um, but, like, yeah, here's a guy whose corpse dances and his body parts fall off. Funny story, but disturbing artwork. And then, man, there's... I want to show. It's, it's the most innocuous scene sometimes. These cats. He's just drawing cats and look how creepy they get. But yeah, like I said, sometimes a story like there's this whole story where someone loses their dog and hears something in the attic and then it ends on this super lame joke and I'm like, okay, not all the humor adds up. But I do like the humor is, I mean, the uh, the humor is okay, but the drawings, it's like, yeah, funny cat story, whatever. I'm going to draw the most terrifying cat you've ever seen. Uh, but anyway, the last section, really more for the adults. Uh, bibliography done old school, how your high school teacher would want you to do it. Uh, but notes explaining a few things about the stories, you know, comparing the big toe to the golden arm, another story about a missing body part, and then like a couple random paragraphs talking about what you should do if you encounter a ghost in real life. Uh, gee, but he also talks about in the back here uh, where he got the sources for all these stories. You know, this encounter is very much based on, say, this version of the story. And then a whole big, long bibliography of all the books he used writing this. And when you're a nerdy adult, you're like, huh, I should start a study in folklore now. And it really does get you into it. So overall, I really did like this book classic, iconic, scary stories, and really well-researched and a good beginning guide to folklore. There's a lot more stuff in here than I thought, and a lot of variety, a game and some songs, uh, stories that are shorter, like one page maybe, and then stories that are a little longer, up to say maybe five, I don't know. But overall, I was really impressed with it. It was a little different than I thought, but very, very fun, and you know, I... Uh, <laughs> I think I said this earlier, I was reading it at 2 a.m. for some reason, and it did get to me a little bit, even as an adult who watches scary movies all the time. Uh, fun, fun stuff. Definitely would recommend it. A classic book for a reason. And I think they did two sequels. It was like more scary stories to tell in the dark and even more scary stories to tell in the dark. I'll definitely be keeping my eyes peeled for those. I, I had fun with this one, and I hope the other two are good as well. So fun, classic folklore stuff. Anyway, if you guys want to see more, a playlist should pop up here on the bottom. That should be my books playlist. I've talked about things like Clive Barker's Hellbound Heart, Goosebumps, Night of the Living Dummy, a few of the Fear Street books. I've, I've gotten a, a few books reviewed, so if you want to see me talk about more books, you can click right there and see more. Anyway, have a good day. I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Relevant playlist on the bottom. Have a good day now.